So we continue in uh, the Lord's harvest, and we want to today talk about decisions that we make for his harvest. Decisions. We all make decisions. By virtue of you sitting here, you have made a decision, isn't it? You have forgone one thing for another. That means you have made a decision. So we are going to talk about decisions for his harvest. And I want to just go into the reading, uh, quite a, a, a lengthy reading, but uh, I will take us through this reading. Uh, this is, uh, and then I will give you the background for this particular reading as well, so that we can have a perspective of what is the background of this particular text that we are reading. And this is from the book of 2 Samuel, Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 24. And I And 
fellowship offering. Then the Lord answered his prayer in behalf of the land, and the plague was stopped. May the Lord bless the reading. So the background of this particular um, um, reading was an incident because David has been a man that has after God's heart. But the backdrop of this um, discourse or this text is about the fact that David went to number the children of Israel. And this was based on ego, mostly just to be able to know how many fighting men do we have. And so he commanded Joab to go and count the men of Israel, those who could be able to draw the sword. And he went for nine months and 20 days, and he counted from Dan to Beersheba, and there were 800,000 from the children of Israel, men who could bow, who could handle the, 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 um, the sword, and 500,000 men who uh, could handle the sword from uh, Judah. Now, um, there are many decisions that we make in, in life. Life is about decisions. We make decisions in every sphere of life, and we make these decisions daily. The decisions are choices, and most of them are based on belief. Research has shown that we make at least 35,000 decisions every day. Some of them we are making consciously, and others we are making subconsciously. An example is perhaps maybe you have set your alarm clock over time, and over a period of time, there is that clock that you know wakes you up without you having to have the alarm going off over time. That is a subconscious over time. And it has also been said that if you repeat something about for 66 days, it becomes a habit. We also want to s note that uh, the choices are so individual that some of them, God doesn't control some of the choices that you're making. Why? Because of an example. If you want to choose to love Jesus and say, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, you can choose against God, isn't it? And not accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Therefore, the decisions can go against God, against the perfect will of God. And not only that, God recognizes that the will of man is very powerful. And for that reason, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, the Lord decided to take a longer route with them because he said that if they go through the hill country of the Philistines and they face war, they might change their mind and go to Egypt. It's just as an emphasis of the choices and the will of man in terms of making those choices. And that's the reason why um, we ought uh, to make choices based on a certain um, parameters or circumstances. However, the choices that we make over time, they have consequences. They may be positive consequences, they may be negative consequences, and some are lifelong decisions that are, are lifelong consequences for us. They may be regrettable at some point, but we do know that God can conspire that a bad aspect can turn out to be for good. So the choices makes, we make have consequences. In a business setup, they go through a systematic process in making decisions. And in the development from example of an organizational uh, strategy or a strategic plan for that matter, they go through a process. And the first is based on data the information that is available out there. We may have what we call the primary information that, that you draw yourself, and you perhaps would want to use an instrument to go out there and collect primary information. But you can also use secondary information based on science that is available. So once you collect the information, you collect the data, you then come up with choices. Based on these choices, you have an opportunity to choose one, to make one choice and discard the other. So therefore, in business setup, decisions are made based on information or data, and those information, the information that we may have, may be internal to the organization, and those ones we call micro elements in the organization. 
But we also have decisions that are external to the organization, and we call those macro information that we are getting so that we can be able to make a, a solid decision. And sometimes we perform what we call a SWOT analysis. A SWOT analysis basically means that we are looking at elements that are internal to the organization, and we are looking at external to the organization in the context of what we say strength and weaknesses, which are internal, and then we have the opportunities and threats which are also external. What I would want to share with us that the critical choices we face under pressure and distress mostly determine who we are. When you are faced with a difficult decision to make, and it is a certain decision that you ought to make, this is the, what really defines you. Why? Because in the aspect where there is no coolness that you have to make a decision, it becomes tricky and sometimes it draws out emotions. And you have seen many times that when somebody is faced with a tough circumstances, you'll find somebody walking back and forth, walking back and forth because sometimes there's something mental that comes with it. Sometimes you see other people, because of a distressful situation, they will go to washrooms. They will go to washrooms maybe four or three times eh? because they are unsettled because they are not able to handle that particular distress. So here we have the servant of God. He has sinned, and God is confronting him with three choices. He admits that I've done foolishly. You know, we all do, uh, we, we might do wrong things, isn't it? But the servant of God here, he says, I have worked, I have done foolishly. And the Lord presents three things that he ought to do. One, three years of famine in your land. By the way, God comes to him and says, choose so that I can return the message to one, the one who sent me, God who has sent me because of this sin. So one, Three years of famine in your land, three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you, as we've seen, three days of plague in the land. And the servant of God here, David, and the difference between David and you see the first king of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin, Saul, himself was a different man. And David, when confronted with a situation where he has gone against God, he says, I have sinned. Immediately he says, I've sinned. He's not defending his position. He says, God, I have sinned. And he's seeking forgiveness. Compared to Saul on the other side, he was sent to go and finish the Amal Amalekites. But, you know, uh, Prophet Samuel comes and asks him, did you do everything that the Lord commanded to do? Yes, I've done everything. And what is this bleating of the sheep that I hear? No, the young men saw that these were good and they wanted to keep it for themselves. He did not execute, and he wasn't remorseful when it comes to uh, sin. And this is why David is called a man after God's own heart. So he's saying here, I'm in distress, but he says he makes a critical decision at the heat of the moment. He says, I am in distress, but he says, let us fall in the hand of the Lord, for I know he knows from knowledge. He is merciful. But do not let me fall in the hand of human. Let me not fall into human hand. He's saying this because he knows a human, human hand. Brothers and sisters, some are, are very unreliable. But this man is talking from knowledge. He says, I know, I know, I know that his mercy is great. That even though I'm in sin, his mercy is great. The Lord may chasten me, but he will not give me over to death. He is a faithful God. His mercy endures forever. But if I go into the hands of men, the men of the world are ruthless. And he knows that a man will not forgive easily. They are ruthless. But what I wanted to emphasize here, David is saying, I know from where he knows. And this is what we want to also to just look at. So, David says that I know. Let us fall into the hand of God, for I know his mercy is great, but do not let me fall into the hand. And I am emphasizing that. Why would you be confronted with all those decisions and you are saying, okay, I, I do not want to go elsewhere. I want to fall into the hand of God. David noted that 
Man first is unreliable and very unforgiving, especially those who are not born again. Have you met people who they also come to church, but when it comes to issues of money, you will not get to the way of those people. They will make decisions that will be weird, and you will be shocked if a man can be able to make these decisions, even a decision to, make, to, you know, to do away with somebody. So David is very much aware of this. And the reason why he is aware of this is because of the fact that King Saul himself pursued him most of the time. And in some occasions, when Saul realized that David wasn't against him in any way, he said, my son, David, okay, I am the one who is on the wrong. Um, um, let's, let's just settle this. But after some time, he, was, he changed his heart again, and he tried as many times as possible to kill David. Absalom was David's son. His own son turned against him. It tells you how unreliable men, is. men are. His own son turned against him and drew up an army and threw him into exile. Your own son taking you to exile. So David came to Ahinahim, or the other side of Jordan. And together with him, he took um, the advisors, the David, David's advisors like um, uh, Ahithophel, who was his advisor at that time. The Bible tells us the human heart is the most deceitful thing and desperately wicked. Who really knows it? That's in the book of Jeremiah. One thing that I see about this man, David, and the what we need to really think about, where did this man draw his mental strength? In a difficult circumstances where there's no motivation, there's nobody to motivate you, brother come, sister come. Where was this man able to draw this strength, the mental strength, when you are faced with tough circumstances? A decision to make, nobody to consult. You know, most of the time, even for younger people, they expect decisions to be made for them. They do not want to make decisions for, for themselves. And as I said, even in decision, not deciding to do anything is also a decision. So, David's message is exhibited in the story of Ziklag. And this is a story that we all know. Ziklag was again a time that David was in exile. He went, after Saul had tried to kill him many times, he said in his heart, one day this guy will succeed and will kill me. So let me go into the Philistine land so that he will be tired of looking for me. And he went to Gath, and the Philistine kings took him. And he was given this city, or is it a town, called Ziklag. This town of Ziklag is where he stayed with his army. Now, when at some point the um, Philistines wanted to fight with Israel, David said to the king of Philistine, let me go with you so that you can be able to see what I can be able to do. But the other kings and princes of Philistine said, no, he cannot go with us. At the heat of war, he might change his mind and fight against us so that he can be, go back to, to the king and make reconcile with, with King Saul. So there was no motivation for it. And when they came back to Ziklag, after a journey of maybe three days, they found the town was burnt and everybody was taken to exile, including the wives and the children. And the men who were with him, they cried. Have you ever heard men crying? You know, these days we don't cry. We say men should not cry. There was a time that I went for a funeral um, where, uh, somewhere in the, the Rift Valley, and there was this young man, it was uh, the grandmother of this young man uh, had passed on, and this young man, um, uh, maybe in his 18 or thereabout, and he was crying, you know. He was really, really, you know, this type of crying until, and then one of the old men says, Punguza hi, punguza hi ujinga. Punguza hi ujinga ya? You know, that is what we encourage in our society. Do not cry. Ladies say, they praise the Lord. Yeah. Crying is good. If crying is good. It's actually therapeutic to cry. When you are facing difficulties, it is good to cry. Because at that point, if you put out that distress, you can have a right frame of mind to make a decision. You might not make the, what we call a rash decision. And this is what we are seeing. David and the men, and if you're talking about weakness, how, how can we say David was weak? A man who has killed Goliath, and a man who has, uh, you know, killed the bear and uh, the lion and all that. 
And they were crying. And you know, they were not crying like, you know, you, you, you go to the back of the tent. No, they were crying loudly. Can you imagine? Men crying loudly. And as a result of that, the action of this man, and I say the mental strength of this man, is something that is worth emulating. He's not a perfect man. But after the crying, and then the people turned against him, and they were thinking of stoning him. They were thinking of stoning David at some point. And David told Abatha, who was a priest, give me the ephod. After crying, you know, so there's nothing wrong with just uh, crying. You know, uh, if you're facing difficult times, sometimes you're very helpless, and the only thing that you can do is to cry. Sometimes if you bottle it up, and you try to use other methods, like maybe you're using drugs to, you know, just to numb the difficulty that you are facing, it might not come out as such. But if you take it out there, the Lord will give you some relief out of that. And the science also shows that, do you know, and I'm not saying that your child should cry, if your child cries, they will go to sleep most of the time. They will go to sleep at some point. So crying isn't bad as long as the child isn't sick. So where there's no motivation, this, this, this man here is facing a tough circumstances, and thereafter, he asked of the Lord, he called for the ephod. And that is why sometimes we say kings, we're talking about kings and priests at the same time. He is coming and he's putting a priestly garment. And in this, he inquires of the Lord. He inquires of the Lord. You know, priestly garment, the manner in which it was, it was done, it, was, it had the breastplate. And in there, the breastplates, there was what we call Urim and Thummim. These were tools that were used to sometimes help in making decisions. Okay? They were called lights and perfections for making decisions. So this, he is taking it from the priest so that he can inquire of the Lord. And David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord said, pursue. Pursue and you will recover everything. Where there's no motivation, where was this man able to draw this particular um, um, mental strength? Jesus in himself, actually, after he has been engaged by people, and because we are talking about his harvest, um, sending people to his harvest, Jesus was engaged by many, by the Pharisees, by the Sadducees, and by the teachers of law, and they were asking him a question. Should we pay taxes? That's one question that was raised. Um, uh, and I think that's a question that we may say, should we pay taxes? <laughs> okay, yeah, should we pay taxes? And Jesus answered. And even on the issue of resurrection and marriage, marriage and resurrection, he answered. Where the Sadducees who doesn't believe, they actually don't believe in resurrection. And they were asking about these seven brothers who all died and they had no child. Then he says, at resurrection, whose wife will she be? And Jesus was demystifying that. Jesus also talked to them about the greatest commandment. And he explained that. But after all this, and that's why in this understanding, the theology or understanding you, the word of God is important is because then you can, you can challenge the people who are perhaps coming to you to challenge you, to challenge your belief, to challenge your understanding of the gospel. So after Jesus has done this, uh, he asked them a question. So this question is in the book of Matthew chapter 22, verse 41. And he says, after all these questions that they were asked, what do you think about the Messiah? What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? And these guys who are learned, they answered very fast. He is the son of David. They replied. And he said to them, how is it then? David speaking by spirit calls him Lord. For he says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your foot. So he is asking, if then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? And the conversation ended. The arguments ended because of the fact that they were not able to decipher or understand more on the issues of the doctrine. So the nature of the sacrifice 
as I mentioned earlier, David actually insisted, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord, my God. Burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So what is a sacrifice? A sacrifice is an act of giving up something highly valued by you for the sake of something else considered to have a high value. It is like an opportunity cost. You are giving up something which is still valuable to you, but you are exchanging that for something that is of higher value. And this definition, I want to just bring it from the perspective of what Paul says. Paul says in the book of Philippians, he says this, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost everything. This is actually what we say, uh, opportunity cost, or this is the act of giving up something that is highly valuable for you for something that is of higher value. That is how we can define sacrifice. There is nothing free in life for everything that you see here. Whether it is this building, whether it's the chairs you are sitting in, sitting on, and um, anything that you are seeing here, someone must have paid for it. Somebody has worked on this. There is nothing for free. As it's always said, there is no free lunch. So there are certain categories of costs that we should pay. The, what we call categories of costs that we should pay. What costs should we pay? One of those costs is the cost of personal consecration. Personal sec consecration means the act of dedicating yourself to service and worship of God. Let the word, the Bible says that, let the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. Or be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So it is about sharing the word of God in the fidelity of the word, the sound doctrine, and Christ-centered focus. Some of the things that we are seeing today, um, in terms of the cultic behaviors and cults and all that, it is because people are sharing the word of God without the fidelity of the word itself and the sound doctrine. So you can be really be motivated and you want to share the things of God. You want to do so much for God, but the doctrine is wrong. So indeed, even the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that Jesus is saying that I will send you another helper, the Holy Spirit. He will remind you of the things that you have learned. Remember, when we say the Holy Spirit reminds you, we are talking about the fact that there's something that you already came across and you already knew, but you have forgotten. So the raw material of the Holy Spirit is based on what you have heard, what you have read, what you have come across. But if you have read nothing, then the Holy Spirit cannot be able to remind you of something that you do not know. So we cannot also serve or honor God by true word from a false heart. Our heart must be right with God. Pay whatever costs to share uh, the gospel in the consciousness and the pure heart, which is what we say should be our motivation. And I wanted to give us an example of the consequences of not consecrating. So you cannot come into the presence of the Lord and think that it, is, it will be things as usual. The presence of the Lord is, must be reverence. You cannot come to this pulpit and think that you can have an impact or pray for people or have an impact in ministry of the word of God without consecrating yourself and preparing yourself for that. It cannot never be casual when you come into the presence of God. You must have dedicated yourself and you are living in purity of the word of God. And one of the, what is uh, being brought in the Bible here, uh, I wanted to bring to us in the book of Acts, um, there were these gentlemen, they were seven sons of Sheba. They saw what Paul was doing. Paul was doing uh, healing the sick and um, doing wondrous things. But these sons of Shiva, we say, say that this thing is very interesting. We will also go and do it. And they went. 
and the result wasn't pleasing. So they went and they started sharing and they say, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, we want to drive out demons. But you know, the demon-possessed man answered them. What did he say? Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Who are you? The thing is, if you are not having a relationship with God, you cannot represent him. You cannot represent God if you are not in a relationship with him. And the relationship is what is in the back end. It means this. It means that you have walked with God. You have consecrated yourself. You walked. You've taken time with God. And the demon-possessed man jumped onto them and overpowered them and gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. I'm not saying this is you, but there is a consequence of not consecrating yourself that you cannot go into the enemy territory if you are unprepared. You must be prepared. You must be consecrated. You must have walked right with God so that you can represent him well. And indeed, it is even true that there are people who are really in their heart, they want to serve God well, one of which is Apollo. Apollo himself was a servant of God. In fact, Paul talks about him that Apollo, you know, I planted and Apollo watered. Apollo himself was serving God vehemently. But one thing that happened at some point when he was sharing in Ephesus and Priscilla and Aquila had about his sharing and it, they saw that there was a gap in his sharing. And in this case, they called him aside because he only knew the baptism of John. He didn't know the baptism of Jesus. And so they call Apollo on the side. That in as much as you are so strong, but you are not on the right doctrine, you might still miss it. The, the other thing about consecration is living right, even amongst yourselves. You know, it, it is true that even your spouse can hinder your prayer. The Bible says that you live with your spouse in a manner that will not hinder your prayer. But Jesus is saying this, therefore, if you offer your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and reconcile to them, then come and offer your gift. It tells you how important it is that you are right with God before you come into the offering of the gift or the sacrifice to God. The second aspect and cost that you need to pay is what we say, cost of diligent preparation. You cannot just go and share the word of God haphazardly. You must prepare. Study to be faithful to the text. Clear in the presentation of the text and compelling in the argument. What does the Bible tell us here? Do you do your best to present yourself to God as one who is approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and correctly handles the word of God. There are some versions that talks about that you have to work very hard or you also have to study to show yourself approved, a workman who needs not to be ashamed and you have to sharing the word of God in truth. And I was just thinking about this, that if we have an example of, you know, preparing ingredients for our food, it takes so much time in preparation of food. And I have seen where perhaps they are preparing chapatis. In the preparation of chapatis, they have to work. They have to work the dough. They have to, you know, they have to add certain ingredients and put things together. And then at some point, I just, I just, when you're just watching, you're seeing, they say that let's put the door to rest a bit. Then they start doing the work. And they make those chapatis. I'm not saying that you think of chapatis now. <laughs> but they make this. They, they make those chapatis. It takes time for the, for the chapatis to be ready. And when it is served on the table, it is nice, isn't it? People share with laughter, isn't it? People share with joy but they do not know what has gone into it. There's a lot of work. It took hours to be able to do chapatis. Oh, and the young man knows here. 
if your mom is preparing or your dad is preparing chapatis, there are young men who can take up to eight chapatis, one young man, eh? isn't it? Eight chapatis. So you can imagine, if you have four of them, how many you will have to make. It's not easy, isn't it? But if you take so much time in the preparation of the chapati and putting all those ingredients and putting everything together, that then the people are sitting on the table and they are enjoying, they are happy. They are actually saying there is anointing in this chapati. There is a lot of work that has gone into it, isn't it? Now, we ask ourselves, when we are presenting the word of God, when you are present, have we taken time to prepare? Or can we just read a verse without connecting them, looking at the pretext and the text, so that we can be able to present God in a way that is befitting of him? So that when we are challenged out there, we are able to defend the faith appropriately. Do you know that there are people who are out there who are prepared to challenge you, and they have something that they have drawn from the Bible itself, especially from uh, maybe our Muslim brothers and all that, there is something that they have. And if you are not grounded, you are not able to take care of that. But I also want to tell, I was telling uh, Pastor Isaac that some of the times we might be blaming people. We are saying the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. But not that the workers are few, the workers are unprepared and they are fearful of being challenged out there because they have not taken time to prepare. They prepare chapati. They prepare and put ingredients on all these. It takes time. If you look at somebody, perhaps maybe it's people who have gone to school here and they have gotten certificates and degrees and diplomas, it has taken time. It has taken lecture after lecture. It has taken time for you to study in the libraries. It has taken so much time for you to be where you are in terms of how you've gone into school. But how come when it comes to God that we are very casual and then we can go there and be challenged by other people? The place of preparation is key. And if you are not preparing, it is compared to this. Malachi, there is a discourse there between the children of Israel who returned from Babylon back uh, from exile. And there was that discord that comes in the book of Malachi that is saying, but you ask, how have we shown contempt to your name? They're asking God. God says, you made, you, you, you've shown contempt to my name. And Jesus, uh, God is asking them, they're asking, how have we shown contempt to your name? And, and God answers this way. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is not that wrong? When you sacrifice lame or deceased animal, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Or try to offer them to President Ruto. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept it? Says the Lord. And this is exactly what we do. If we are not prepared, then we are offering blind animals for sacrifice. We are offering lame or deceased animal for sacrifice. So the place of diligent preparation, even as we go out there, and I heard of the report that was given by my brother Getange here about 61 people reaching so many people. Yeah? That's a great sacrifice. And may, we, may, may, may the Lord really continue to bless those who are going out there and making those sacrifices. So you should not present to God a sacrifice of blemish, a sacrifice that has dosari. So prepare, area of preparation is important. And then I will go to the other that you need to pay, the cost that you also need to pay. You need to pray. You need to pray. Do not take it easily. Do not just take it lightly. And I, I, I was looking for this, uh, looking at this gentleman called Samson. Samson, you know, God has endowed him with a lot of power and all that. And he can say that, you know, the Philistines are upon you and he, the Philistines are upon you. The Philistines are upon you. And the guy comes off strong. But there's a time that he didn't know that God has left him. You know? In that place. He did not go that the God has left him. And he will say, I'll do it as I used to do it. So that's why you must continue to be in the presence of the Lord. And prayer is key. You have to pray. You need to pray for the clarity of sharing. The word that you're going to share. You pray about it. That people may be receptive to the word that you're going to share with them. That the Lord will govern even the presentation on how you're going to share. That people will encounter Christ. 
But even in prayer, there's a price to pay. The price to pay is time. You know, we are talking about plug and persist. We are talking about you coming here so that you can spend time in the presence of the Lord and pray. It is time consuming, and that is a price to pay. There is also comfort. There are others who might stay out there and say that, you know, I want to warm my blanket. But you are making a sacrifice. You're making the sacrifice of comfort and the energy. And I like the music team. They spend a lot of time. If you come here over the week, you'll find that they are preparing. They are spending their energy so that they can be able to pay the price. They can be able to sacrifice and give God the very best because they are prepared so well. You can sometimes have to forego your food. In prayer and fasting, I think it was announced that here that the children will have the 40 days of prayer and fasting. So sometimes you will forego all this. So three things that I've talked about. The first one is about consecration, and which I've said the act of dedicating yourself for service and worship of the Lord. And you cannot go casually before the Lord. Diligent preparation, I've said, you must prepare. Just as we prepare our chapatis, we ought to prepare. And the cost of prayer. Prayer is the most important because then you can be able to draw your strength and God is able to use you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Now, I want to talk about the altar. David raised an altar. After the Lord had relented about this plague, he actually, developed, he actually raised an altar. And why is the altar important? The altar is a sacred place for sacrifice and gifts to God. It's coming from a word called alterium, which means high. So the altar presents an occasion, and look at it this way, is an occasion that God, occasion and a place where God have given you a personal encounter. Where you have encountered God, you raise an altar. Whenever the Lord reveal himself to you, raise an altar in that place. Every place that the Lord has the Lord has come through for you, you are praying about a matter, and the Lord came through for you. Raise an altar in that particular place. Raise an altar. It doesn't have to be a physical altar, but it's a place that you need to recognize God. You need to recognize that the Lord has come through for you. Maybe you had a difficult moment. Maybe you're expecting a baby. Maybe a job. You can have a, a situation where that you can... You can um, put that in every year or anniversary, you have that place of remembrance, what the Lord has done for you. Do not allow a visitation, a sacred visitation by the Lord to pass without maximizing on the purpose of that visitation. Maximize on that purpose of visitation, where the Lord has blessed you. Never forget where the Lord has appeared to you. Never forget to raise an altar in that place. A place where then we say is a control tower and a transmission station where you can communicate to God and thank him for forgiving you, for helping you in a situation that you are in, for blessing you in one way or another. So never forget to raise an altar. And that's why we see David raised an altar at the threshing floor of Arona the Jebusite. So in conclusion, I, we have talked about that we make decisions every day. We make decisions, as many as 35,000 each day. That knowledge of God helps us to make decisions. Knowledge about God helps us to make decisions. The Lord is ready to forgive and restore us. Indeed, his mercies endure us forever. Let the children of God say, his mercies endure us forever. His mercies endure us forever. He is a faithful God. No wonder the man of God said, I'd rather fall in the hand of God rather than man because he is merciful. There is a price to pay in following God. There is a price to pay. And one of the price that you need to pay is a price of consecration. Spending time, walking with God, walking right, walking in holiness. And there is a price of prayer. It takes time to pray. It's not just a five minutes prayer. And there is a price to pay for preparation before you go into the presence of the Lord. So we can then offer acceptable sacrifices in the altar of God when we are right with him. When we are right with him, the offering and the sacrifices that we offer to God will be acceptable to him. We also ought to maximize 
on God's visitation. When God visits us, we maximize on the visitations. And sacrifices attract blessings. And the benefit of the sacrifices that we make, you know, that has costed us something, the measure that you're using in giving determines the measure of reception. The measure that you use in giving something of value to God determines the measure of reception of the blessings of God. The Bible says, give and it shall be given to you. Not as you gave it, but pressed down, shaken together and running over, will pour into your lap. For the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. But indeed, the Lord returns it to you, not only as you gave it, but he returns to you, pressed down, you know, so that he can make room, shaken together and running over so that it can, or, you know, bless your brothers and sisters. So the sacrifice is not based on how much you have given, but the value that you attach to it. The sac how much has it costed you? Jesus is teaching the disciples that it is not the amount of what is given that is important, but rather the sacrifice made in the offering. Indeed, the Bible tells us that a gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. It is indeed more blessed to give than to receive. So the invitation that I want to share with you now today is this. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. God gave the very best, his only begotten son, to die for us that we may be able to attain redemption. You need to meet the requisite by accepting Jesus so that your sacrifice to God may be acceptable. Our sacrifices to God are not acceptable if we haven't been able to meet the requisite that is following Jesus Christ and walking with him, accepting him as Lord and Savior. David says this, when in sin, the Lord will not delight in your sacrifice. In the book of uh, Psalm 51, David is saying, you do not desire in sacrifice or I would offer it. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken heart. You will not reject a broken heart and a repentant heart. The Lord will not reject a broken and a repentant heart. This is where we are. We ought to offer our sacrifices. But before even we go come to God, so that our sacrifices will be acceptable to him, we first have to come to him with a broken and a repentant heart. And we have to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So what are you willing to sacrifice, brothers and sisters? What are you willing to sacrifice to the Lord? And this is the question to you that you go home with to think about, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What kind of sacrifice am I going to give to the Lord? Have you accepted Jesus? In our midst, there are people who may have not accepted Jesus so far. But remember that you cannot offer an acceptable sacrifice before you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And as I call Pastor Isaac, I want to ask of us, um, for those who might want to give their lives to, to Jesus today, so that you can be able to offer a perfect sacrifice that is acceptable before God. Anyone who would want to give their lives to Christ can raise up your hand. Okay. So thank you very much. And uh, may we go out there and offer the right sacrifice to God that has costed us in Jesus' name. May the Lord bless us. Amen. And as we continue to share in this month, that we will offer acceptable sacrifices that is acceptable to him in Jesus' name.